Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for taking time out of your afternoon to listen to our capstone defense. My name is Sam Newmark, and I'm here with my colleague, Mary Schmitz, to share our research journey in our capstone project. Our research focuses on the role of expert group decision making and the translation of new health technologies, specifically pharmacogenomic testing. And before we begin, we want to disclose that I receive federal scholarship funding from the Social Studies and Humanities Research Council. We have a student practicum agreement with Ontario Health, but receive no financial compensation. And this project was conducted with the support of Ontario Health, who receives funding from the Government of Ontario. Parts of this presentation are based on data and information provided by the agency. However, the opinions and results presented do not necessarily reflect those of Ontario Health. Today, we'll provide a background of our project, how we approached the capstone, our research methods, a description of our case study, the results of our decision analysis, some key takeaways, and knowledge translation activities. For those of you viewing a TRP defense or webinar for the first time, translation in healthcare is all about moving discoveries from the laboratory, clinic, or community into interventions to improve patient care. These discoveries can vary from medications to medical devices, guidelines, or even policy. And the overall spectrum of research can involve many different stages illustrated in this graphic. And the academic field of translational research seeks to understand the interactions between these stages to accelerate health innovations and ultimately improve people's health and their quality of life. While each aspect of research is important and we would love to study each one, our project focuses on the latter half of this graphic with society and health systems. And one of the most critical steps in the implementation stage of new health technologies is developing a preliminary strategy and decision-making processes for health systems. This stage of translation can involve key decisions by expert groups. And even though these expert groups are very common throughout our health system, there is little available information on how these groups make decisions, develop strategies, or generate recommendations. So we decided to investigate pharmacogenomic testing, which is one health technology actively traversing translational pathways in Ontario. So pharmacogenomics, or PGX, is the study of how our genes affect the rate at which we process medications. These differences in metabolic rates can lead to poor health outcomes, such as adverse drug reactions, negative side effects, or a lack of treatment response. PGX testing looks for genetic differences, which can predict these metabolic changes, and test results can help prescribers make adjustments to either optimize treatment or potentially avoid an adverse reaction. Testing is done by collecting a blood or saliva sample to analyze a patient's genetic information. Testing can be done either before or after prescribing a drug, and the lab results are sent back to the ordering provider who can discuss this with the patient and adjust their treatment if needed. Now, what does PGX testing look like in Ontario? Well, at the private level, there are some direct-to-consumer options from dedicated PGX companies or established lab services. At an organizational level, there are some hospital-based pilot programs available to small groups of eligible patients. But at a system level and across North America, really, implementation is slow, low, or non-existent. But the government here has set PGX as a priority topic to be investigated further. And to further understand the current state of PGX in Ontario, we use the adapted translational thinking framework to help guide us towards a research question. For our project, we focused on the first half of the framework, the understand stage on the left, and went through several iterative cycles at different times throughout our capstone. Beginning with identifying problems in the PGX space, we spoke with stakeholders in industry, research, clinical care to really understand the field. Then once we understood the PGX landscape, we set out to recognize unmet needs. There was a clear gap in system level implementation and an unmet need to understand how strategies are developed to translate PGX testing into routine clinical practice. We then framed our research to focus on the government context and associated decision-making processes because of the important role our government plays in the Ontario health system. So this brought us to our research question. How do governments make decisions about developing strategies for the adoption, evaluation, and implementation of novel health technologies? And it's important to note here that in our research context, implementation refers to creating system level guidance for evaluating evidence, assessing reimbursements, and standardizing reporting. 
To help us answer these research questions, we set three main objectives. First, to explore and understand how the Ontario government develops a strategy for PGX testing implementation. Second, analyze the process of how the group generates a recommendation report. And thirdly, to overall improve the understanding of how expert groups make decisions about implementing PGX at a system level. To fulfill these objectives, we chose a case study approach using qualitative methodologies. These methods allowed for an in-depth view of real-world events and is also known to be appropriate study designed to study translational processes. For our research, we selected the Ontario Health Pharmacogenomics Working Group, which was convened by the Provincial Genetics Program to develop a recommendations report to guide implementation and delivery of PGX testing. Ontario Health is a government agency that oversees um, that oversees uh, everything such as health delivery, quality guidance, and recommendations in the province. This case in particular was valuable to research due to its multidisciplinary nature, the fact that we were actively performing a translational process, and the potential applicability to other emerging technologies. To conduct our project, we signed formal student agreements with Ontario Health which allowed us to be participant observers. And this dual role enabled us to attend all meetings, fully understand the context of decisions and have access to all documentation. The data we collected involved group level characteristics with no personal information, involving meeting minutes, slide decks, report drafts, email correspondences, researcher notes from observations and meeting recordings. And we use an inductive descriptive methods to analyze and report working group processes and decisions, which I'll elaborate on in a bit more detail before discussing our key decision themes. Our study received research ethics board approval, and we also obtained permission and consent from Ontario Health to use the working group data for research purposes. So to answer our research question, we reported on the group characteristics, meetings, and group activities, and we also conducted a decision analysis to better understand the process. So let's take a closer look at the PGX working group, starting with group characteristics. There were 22 members total, nine of which were Ontario Health representatives, with the other 13 being external specialists from a variety of related disciplines, such as clinical biochemistry, genetic counseling, pharmacy, clinical medicine, molecular genetics, clinical pharmacology, drug evaluation at the Ministry of Health, and ourselves as graduate students. Most of the professions were represented by two members, as is shown in the graph, and it's also of note that 92% of the external specialists reported a hospital as their primary affiliation. Now, looking at the meetings, all were virtual and core working group meetings were about an hour and a half long. You can see a simplified timeline at the bottom of the slide with whole group meetings represented by the large blue circles, about one every month, and seven small group meetings on the dark blue circles, which occurred across four days in the middle of the timeline. These small meetings had one to four specialists present at a time and lasted typically 30 minutes to an hour. Around these core meetings, there were eight administrative meetings, which can be seen in light blue, and then external touch points are represented in orange. Since the main output of the working group was the recommendation report, we created a process map to visualize this. Now this slide shows a simplified version of our full process map, just to give you an idea of the overall flow. We use a swim lane design, which goes chronologically from left to right, with the horizontal lanes indicating who is responsible for each activity within it. The Ministry of Health is at the top in blue, then Ontario Health and the Provincial Genetics Program in green, the PGX working group itself is the yellow lane, and finally external groups are pink. This process map uses established symbols with start and stop points represented by ovals, activities as squares, decision points by gray diamonds, and documents represented by wavy squares. Alternative optional processes are shown by dotted lines. So in this case, the process started with the ministry identifying PGX as a priority topic and then requesting support from the Ontario Health Provincial Genetics Program. The PGX working group was then formed and the first meeting led to the decision to approve the group's scope and core topics for the report. Next, the group moved into core work, which was completed entirely by either Ontario Health or the working group. This encompassed the remaining three working group meetings, as well as alternative process of incorporating those small group meetings, which we discussed. In parallel with these meetings, Ontario Health Administrators were creating the report outline, an intake process map, and conducting a jurisdictional scan. This information, along with all the group discussions, formed the first draft of the report, which was approved by the working group chair prior to going to the general members for review. 
This launched the review process of the report creation, which began with two weeks of internal review, followed by feedback incorporation by Ontario Health. Then an updated copy of the report was sent for external review to two Ontario Health reference tables for primary care and for patients, along with four PGX experts outside of the working group, both in Canada and abroad. Feedback from external review was then incorporated and the final draft was approved by the working group chair and provincial genetics program leadership before being sent to the ministry for final approval before publication. And throughout this process of generating the report, there were many key decisions that influenced the outcome. Before I share the results, I'll explain our method of analysis here. We began with familiarizing ourselves with the data. This was mostly facilitated by attending all the working group meetings and reviewing all the documents. We then identified, collected, and stored all the materials relevant to answer our research question. We created an iterative codebook with codes to characterize the phases of decisions, like identification, discussion, final communication, deferment, and external consultations, or structured consensus building activities. We also labeled decisions as administrative or scientific content related. Once we had our codes ready, we independently reviewed all of the collected materials to categorize the key decisions and processes. And prior to reviewing everything, we performed a pilot exercise on the materials from the first meeting to ensure consistency of our analysis. After reviewing all of the raw data, Mary and I returned together to consolidate our information to generate a list of key decisions and how they occurred based on a set criteria. We then used our meeting recordings to check the accuracy of our data and also conducted semi-structured interviews with two Ontario Health staff and the working group chair to confirm our results. With any new data collected during this process, we repeated the previous steps and integrated all results together. After going through all these steps, there were four main themes that emerged from our analysis we found that the decisions made throughout the development of an implementation strategy by the working group can be summarized into who is involved, how the group is managed, what is discussed, and when and where the information is shared. Below each theme in the chart is a list of corresponding key decisions. Beginning with who is involved, some key decisions included the membership of the group, such as adding a community pharmacist to the team, deciding to have an external consultations with the Ministry of Health representatives, and having targeted reviews with select individuals as opposed to an open call to the public. Looking at decisions about how the group was managed, we found the mode of delivery, which was fully virtual, was a key choice from the organizers, and also deciding to add smaller meetings to support the large group sessions, along with administrative decisions on how to reach consensus and perform voting exercises. The next theme was mostly related to pharmacogenomics related content, like the decisions about definitions and the scope of the group. Another notable decision was deciding to develop a process map to facilitate future evaluation and implementation of PGX testing, and also to create a, uh, um, sorry, a list of priority judging pairs, which was facilitated by a voting exercise mentioned in the last theme. With all the scientific discussion, deciding the sources of evidence and established clinical guidelines to use was a key component. And looking at preemptive or reactive testing circumstances also garnered lots of discussion along with deciding whether to use existing lab reporting standards. Also, jurisdictional stands was important to continuously monitor the current state of pharmacogenomics in the province for new clinical evidence or even other system level guidance from other jurisdictions on how to implement these tests in a health system. With any group groups making decisions, figuring out how to manage the information and where it will be shared is an important consideration, such as the flow of information in meeting minutes, slide decks, and which softwares to use, and also deciding how to disseminate the recommendations while maintaining confidentiality until receiving appropriate approvals to share publicly. Now, the purpose of our research was to better understand how governments make decisions about developing strategies for the adoption, evaluation, and implementation of novel health technologies. And our decision analysis revealed that one of the methods used by the Ontario government is forming expert groups. And as our case study showed us, a government can make decisions about how a group functions by monitoring and controlling certain aspects of the group's activities, such as who is involved, what is discussed, how the group is managed, and when and where information is disseminated. 
And these decisions represent tools of influence used to guide an expert group through the development of an implementation strategy report. And this helps to ensure a certain level of efficiency, standardization, and practicality of any guidance products that are produced. And it's important to note here that the PGX working group was successful in achieving their goal of reducing a recommendations report. The group was run efficiently and not did not need additional resources um, or time. The report was relatively standard compared to other Ontario health guidance products, and there's a level of practicality to the recommendations. So while the use of decisions as guiding tools was certainly the big takeaway for us, there are some additional points that we'd like to discuss. The unique scope of this group was something that came up not only in our own analysis, but also in our member checking interviews. The core work of this group was system level as opposed to addressing a single clinical question, test, or disease state, and this differs from what many other working groups focus on. The group also discussed whether or not a full health technology assessment would always be needed for every future individual PGX test, um, as this would currently be the case. These assessments are time and resource intensive, so if ever developed, a rapid review process could have notable impact not only in PGX evaluation, but on other rapidly evolving technologies as well. Another interesting point was engagement levels, and this really deserves future attention that we could not afford in this project, but engagement levels were loosely monitored insofar as informing the shift to small group meetings to help promote better engagement on complex topics. And also, while a majority of members did participate in activities like the small group meetings and the voting exercise, not all working group members participated, uh, however, individual reasons are unknown. Now, with any multidisciplinary groups, such as in PGX, there were likely power dynamics that influenced how the group functioned, especially across all the various topics. Some experts may have been perceived to have more expertise than others, even within the same professional field, and that may have affected the way in which discussions play out. Now, again, this was unfortunately not within the scope of our project, but it is worth keeping in mind when looking at any multidisciplinary expert groups. Now, we're all pretty familiar with virtual meetings at this point, but remote meetings come with pros and cons. Of course, you lose out on seeing everyone's face in larger meetings, as well as body language or casual side conversations. But at the same time, remote meetings facilitate better attendance, um, allow for larger geographic reach, and real-time sharing of materials or links. It also offers participants the opportunity to comment verbally or through the chat function. Finally, our results showed that a lack of dissent was the main method of consensus building for this group, aside from the voting exercise. But from a recent systematic review, which looked at 26 expert groups and their consensus building, this is actually quite normal and about 60% of those groups also used discussion with a lack of dissent to build consensus. Now this segues well into our future directions because we think that this use of a lack of dissent to build consensus can be explored further. And while it doesn't involve formal features such as a survey, there is still room to investigate if there are commonalities across groups, if there are settings where it's most appropriate, or if there are maybe best practices to facilitate it. Now, we can't discuss future work without recognizing the biggest limitation of our own research, which is that this was a single case study and so generalizability is low. Our biggest call to action for future work is to conduct more case studies looking at expert groups and the development of system level strategies. But we also recognize that case studies can be quite labor intensive, so when a case study is not feasible, future expert groups can still briefly report on their methods to help build data points that could then later be synthesized. This would also promote transparency on how decisions are being made. So I've been covered a lot of content today. We want to quickly summarize the key takeaways from our work. Implementation strategy development is a key step in translational research pathways. The government frequently forms expert groups to help develop these strategies and important decisions are made throughout to guide their work. These key decisions are used as guiding tools to ensure a level of efficiency, standardization, and practicality for the government. And describing the decision-making process of expert groups helps increase transparency and highlights the critical role they play in the translational pathway of novel multidisciplinary health technologies. We have already had some opportunities to disseminate these key takeaways in three posters, an oral presentation, and a published abstract. And over the coming months, we plan to present our findings at a communities of practice group at Ontario Health, publish our work in an academic journal in the form of a case study or commentary, and share our learnings in a report to the provincial genetics program. We would like to thank our mentors throughout the project, our supervisors, Joseph and Richard, and our project advisors, Daniel, Aisha, and Zubin for the continuous advice and support over the last year. 
We would also like to thank Kathleen Bell and Rachel Healy from Ontario Health who supported us throughout our project and the entire translational research program at the University of Toronto. To our peers who continuously provided us with feedback, the faculty for sharing lessons with all our courses, and the staff who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure everything runs smoothly. Thank you. And here we have our references. And time for some questions. <laughs>